Um, are you going to talk this morning about the, the fate of the pristine death of the Amazon basin? And basically, what it is, the, first, the Amazon basin, the jungles and forests, have always been thought of as the original virgin uh, jungle. Uh, just small bands of uh, native indigenous people running around and not disturbing the Amazon. What we find now is that in the last 30 years, they became a tremendous amount of information and taking the best out of things. So, what we will do is to go back with people with some science and can give them a vision of what the scope of what we're talking about. And then we're going to have some more of that discussion this evening. Alright? So, there are three items that was controversy about the pristine uh, the of the Amazon basin. One has to do with something called terra preta, and we'll see what that is. The other is the actual archaeological and anthropological information that's available. And the other is something called geoglyphs. Geoglyphs are large quantities. Uh, when you look from the sky, you see large forms of the ground, which are actually man-made structures of different kinds. Right? But it is indeed, that's why it's important to see the visuals first, so you get a good sense of what they're talking about, and then we come out and talk about the specifics. Right? So that's basically where we come out. I was not raising the considered version, because it's not based on terra-credit, geographs, and the archaeological and anthropological field. And then there is some implications for that. Okay, then yes. Let me cut the lines. Maybe see this one. Okay, let's go to the next one. Basically, a short story which ostensibly is based on historical events. Right? The myth that we're talking about is the myth that the Amazon basin is the pristine forest having two hostile declining and poor soils, poor soils, soils that are incapable of sustaining large sedentary populations. Thus, you only have small bands of people who are moving around. This is the Amazon Basin, is shown in yellow. It is really most of South America. The town of Georgetown, this is the top land, must be Atlantic Ocean. These are the conflicting facts of the document of the Terra geographs, and archaeological and anthropological information. Now, this is Terra literally means Black Earth. Right. The soil on the right is virgin uh, earth, and the soil on the left is literally man-made. All right, black earth. Now, for those of you who want copies of the slides, leave your email address. I can email you a copy of the slides. There's also a paper that goes with this. I can email you a copy of them. Because I think the visual is really are not very extensively put in on, on in the form that you can publish right now. So this is what Terra Credit is, the bit of the back. This is where it's found in the Amazon. The black dots, and those are along the major drainages and right along the boundaries. It occupies space even in the air. You see the top dot at the center of the page. That is the end. It's in the Angie, the release, the little release here. Now you heard the speaker this morning talk about our connections in the Angie. They are deeper than the next. Now this is a chip that we feel is going to go back to the top. This is with Terra Prep. It's really not supposed to be there, right? It's mere, it's mere existence, is a problem. 
his age. Ten years ago, since his mandate, 9,000 years ago, it was placed by people who knew how to, how to place it. All right? Besides, there are lots and sizes of 900 acres. In other words, there are not garden plots of humans. So that you can plant in the yard and it grows. Distribution becomes of a few 10% of the Amazon basin, which is significant. And its properties. It's man made, it's known as the richest soil on earth. It regenerates itself, meaning if you excavate and you leave a base of 18 inches, it will grow back in 10 years. It regenerates itself, and of course, it has the highest carbon content. This, which is what the seven days since the nutritional value of plants and so forth. What this means then is the first tenet of the pristine myth. It destroys that because large populations have been living and feeding themselves in the Amazon basin for thousands of years based on just the existence of terapeutic. If you have a 900 acre field of terapeutic, that could not be there unless you have a large population. To put it there. Okay? So that is one. These are geoglyphs. They are forms that are on the ground which you didn't ever recognize until recently. And then they realize that these are not just forms on the ground, they, they are made placed there by man. And uh, they're still trying to find them to the extent. But they normally represent mounds, embankments, uh, roads water reservoirs, things that definitely indicate that humans have been in that, in that area. This is a one, this is a, a top drawing that shows two rivers connected by a canal. That is man-made. Again, it's not supposed to be there in the pristine jungle. The bottom is a better one that is a feeder canal system, a water management system. You see the line? Showing the, the bottom, showing the drainage actually working as the time when the water is there. 
and the raised beds are used for the plant. This is in Ashuri. This is in Gaeta, uh, East of Berlin. This is an area defined uh, by a series of mounds, uh, shell mounds, mounds that exist in Gaeta. This is a typical mid, where it's a, it's a man-made uh, circle with vegetation, and below that, um, the fields are planted and then water. Uh, when the floods come, people still are to live and planted on these areas. This is in Bolivia, this is in each little block there is also a mountain. And this is the thousands and thousands. And these are things again were all man-made thousands of years old. Now the question was who put these there? This is a similar mountain system but you notice the, the crack on the right. An earthquake created that crack which means it interrupted the drainage when the drainage is interrupted the, the area cannot get that, uh, irrigated, it dries up. This is what it looks like when that occurs. The people, was who did this and what's their identity? And this is uh, this interesting part also. This is part of the archaeological information and anthropological information. This is an area where they have done most of the studies that you will be in Buddhism. This is where we have heard of the Lucia, the show. Thousand-year-old African woman. All right. Well, on the bottom here, this is this is the bottom dash lines where we were just looking at the state of minus curious. But the picture that you just saw came from all these characters here: Inca, Rondolia, Mato Grosso, and Farah, Morano, Mejia. These are the most populous. Uh, um, the states that have the largest population of Africans, 76% of the population is in the Africa. Now, what the research is showing is that the, the people that actually were old enough to place the things that we just talked about, the geographs and the, and the terracotta, particularly the terracotta, are non mongolian non-Mongolian, meaning their ancestors didn't come from the station. They didn't walk over the Iron Street. And they're specifically not like current Native Americans. Now this is a point that the researchers have made very clear. Non-Mongolian are not like Native Americans. When you look then at the when you put together the information about the African community in Brazil and in South America, and you put together the existence of the locations of Terracotta and uh, Geodes. The face of Brazil. We ask you first, first of all, where did these people come from 20,000 years ago? Well, they came from, as um, Professor Robinson was indicating before, they came from West Africa. What you see there is a picture of a harbor literally another chamber, but it is underwater, about 120 feet underwater, off the coast of um, Miami. This you can go, this is a tourist attraction, you can go and get a diving boat, and you can visit this yourself. What it means is that people who are traveling, Africans who are traveling between Africa and South America, North America and South America, the Americas, 20,000 years ago. This is before the sea that arose its, its current position. And then the, the fact that Bimini Harbor, which is the modern picture, and this is an artist's impression of it there, this is what you will see when you go through the bottom of the boat. That similar type of harbor exists in many places in the Mediterranean. The harbor of the boat is what is now Alexandria, it's just like that. So there's no, there's no mistake that this is an accident. The people who built the two are exactly the same. And there are like 40 of these uh, harbors in the Mediterranean, similar to the ones there. Um, we also had King Abu Bukhari II making a major uh, massive integration, migration into Pernambuco, into the sea in, in the early um, 1300s. In 1300, as a matter of fact, about 2,400 ships 
came from man, that that is the richest, richest, literally the richest uh, kingdom in the, in the world. They were, they were bankrupt uh, Saudi Arabia. And he is the person who started a massive migration. And what is happening is that the archaeological information is very fine that there has been, in fact, this massive influx of people. So when you look, put that all together, the face of when you put the terracotta, you look at the geoglyphs, you look at the non vulnerable nature of the people who put this together, based on all of that information, the face of South America looks like this. It's a bad face. Right. And what current information is saying is that South America has a founding population which is not Mongoloid and not like current North Americans. Right? It's black people. Not as thought and expected, with the Africans civilized the Greeks, the more civilized the Spanish and the Portuguese. Right? So it's not surprising at all that the West Africans have been coming across for thousands of years were the people that brought civilization to the Americas. And then this is based on the terracotta existence, the geodes that we've seen, and that's just a few. And the facts that the archaeological information is in fact saying that they are not all the world, which means they're not the station in origin, and they're not like the current uh, North Americans. So the, the first thing that basically is being abandoned based on specific we can't believe that anymore. The population is 50,000 feeding themselves, uh, 200,000 feeding themselves. It's not a pristine death. Now, it's not new. Ivan Van Serpen has said this in 1987. When he said he came to Columbus, and he's written extensively about that. But Dr. David Kimmelka is saying the same thing. He's also now saying they came before the Mongols, before the Mongols crossed the Bering Strait. All right, and that's that uh, Egyptian harbor is a part of his work. It's empty, and there's a lot of information in this specific book here, where he's done years and years of research on this particular thing. So it's not it's not something that is accidental. It's not a one shot. Uh, West Africans have been coming to the Americas with such frequency that they have to build a harbor in order to accommodate their family. So what it says is that Africans are the first to civilize the Americans. Ancient African-American nations existed thousands of years before the law was called the Grand Strait. By evidence, traveled between the Otis and Bimini Harbor by ancient Egyptians, by the Mayans more recently, and of course in between that there we have heard all the mixed and wars. And that ocean, by the way, used to be called the Ethiopian Ocean. There were so many black people going back and forth. We, 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 recent times, historically, it became known as the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so, the offshoot of that is that Terracotta is just another African legacy, similar to the pyramids, and similar to the features of the civil grand of the branches in the and so the geodes. Because just as the pyramids, we don't know who built them, the Terracotta, we don't know or they're not acknowledging who put them there. Right? Because if they acknowledge that, then it puts archaeology and anthropology in an uproar. Which they acknowledge, the whole history needs to be written anyway. So, but this is the kind of thing that we can't ignore because we have to acknowledge these things as African legacy. Thank you.
I'm setting up. Why don't you take questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. So you take your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. technological disruption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to give an answer. Students of history heard all about the Bering Strait and so on. I've seen this presentation to think into things in a different type of perspective. So I'm certain that we should be present. There's too much information to do. And this totally This This is why this is. One of the slides is actually about this presentation. And then, but the visuals, I think you need to know what Terra Perfect exists, which is what the purpose of this, and not to really give you an in depth lecture. It's not possible. But it's what information or information is not. We don't know that Terra Perfect even exists. Now, you've seen a picture of it. Like it's actually black earth. You can go to Barakara and it's there. Right? You can see it, you can see it everywhere where there's a, in an African presence, there is black there is uh, black or there is terror. Right? It's not something again that you can you can, you can formulate because you stop. Yeah. It is something that you have to have the technological know-how to, 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 to put into place. The fact that it's 9,000 years old. Not people who are just here have no place there in, in that history. That's why I'm so, saying that it, 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 you can't formulate a question. Right, I know. Because it just, <laughs> the, whole well, thing can, the whole thing just comes, you know. The idea is just to digest it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and like I said, I can send you, I can email the presentation to you so you can look at the pictures yourself. Mm -hmm. right. And then if you have any questions, you feel free to ask. Yes, please. Yes, today. thank you for a very interesting presentation. And in fact, um, I had the fortune, good fortune of flying over the Barbies mm -hmm. um, with George Simon. And George Simon, yes, George Simon, he had done a lot of work with the And we flew over and we saw the buildings, etc. Right. And George subsequently did some excavation. Yes. Um, I have been doing some work on some history of Canada, etc. too. But one question I, I would be happy to just quickly sketch out what happened to the black population after this period because we grew up knowing the Mongoloids right, yes. and you don't see the traces of the black of the earlier black populations. Okay. So if you can very quickly say how did it, how did how did the transformation happen? Or yes. I will answer that is if you go to Egypt right now. If you go to Egypt right now, you will see all Arabs. Right? You will see all Arabs. Mm -hmm. If you go to all the major cities, if you travel up and down the Nile, you've done that. You see all Arabs. Yet, the Arabs never built any major structure in Egypt. They had nothing to do with the pyramids, they had nothing to do with uh, the temples of Luxor, they have nothing to do with any other, any of the construction that you see there, yet there the population is. Mm -hmm. What happens is that people, just as is happening right now, it happened in the United States, if you go there now, you would hardly believe that even the non-Mongoloids, even the Mongoloids were the dominant population at one time. So this is, this is the progress of, the, of time and how people move around, they don't dial completely, right? They just phase into different aspects of life. The people, the, the, the pharaohs of Egypt's uh, relatives, their descendants, still live. In, they move from Egypt, but they still live in, based in the eastern regions of Ghana. They have studied the DNA and relate the pharaoh Tutankhamun. picture you saw on, on, on the slide here. His descendants live in eastern eastern regions of Ghana. Right? So the population is just blended and up. As is happening right now. So if you go to Egypt, you will not believe that the Egyptians never, the current Egyptians, 
the Arabs never built a single pyramid. Yet they're collecting revenues and acting as though it's theirs. It was before their time. They came in in 660 AD. Those things were built 4000 BC. But the similar thing here. What we're talking about are people who put the terapeutic in place. Why? The terapeutic that, you, that, that, um, that we know in the Bubis, Kanji area, is 5,000 years old. The people use it. Now, if you ask uh, the Ambulance where you get the biggest disaster, they know all the terapeutic terap terap areas, but they're not the ones who put it. You ask them how it got there. We just know that if you find this black earth, you plant, because that's where you're going to get the richest. But they're serious. I mean, this is, instead of having cassavas this big, they get cassavas that big. It is literally the richest soil. But they didn't put it in. Just as the Egyptian, the current Egyptians, the Arabs, never built a pyramid. But they're leaping into farms, um, reserves as those there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about regeneration okay. of the terapeutic. Mm -hmm. So then, if someone should smartly decide to take some terapeutic and transport it to another location, then that should cause terapeutic to go there? Or how is the regeneration done? How regeneration? What is the process of the regeneration? Right. That we don't know. That these are these are like the mysteries of uh, Egyptians, right? Mm -hmm. Building the pyramids. We don't. There are still there are more research institutes studying terapeutic in the world than, than anything else in the world. If you pull up the more Google Institute studying terapeutic, you will see yeah. Europe is peppered with everybody studying terapeutic because they're trying to figure out what it is. Still, they don't know what. It is. What they do know, though, if you, if you dig a bed, if you have a bed that is three uh, meters thick, and you take off um, a meter, two meters, and you leave a meter in place, ten years later, that two meters will go back. It's the microbial action, the microbial so action. I'm saying that if you transport some of it into another location, okay. we don't know that. that. They, they have not done that. They are, no, they are not old enough to do that. Meaning, it, it may take a thousand years before they therapeutic develops because it's like a little child. Right? Mm -hmm. I can do certain things as a little boy. I'm not ready to do certain things until I become a big man. Okay? So we are now in the stage, science is now in the stage where they are looking at therapeutic and saying, what's making this thing work? And the whole th thinking still is at the juvenile stage. Right? Now therapeutic is located in two places on the face of this earth. It's located in South America and it's located in Africa. Here, it's located in Benin, it's located in Liberia, it's located in South Africa. It's not located in any sense. So that gives you an indication of what we're talking about in terms of its specificity, in terms of its origin. It's not so. Now, in Brazil, once they discovered what you were talking about, they were mining it literally mining it, selling it in, in, in spotted soil, until the Brazilian government said, no, 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 they stopped it. They literally put a law in place and said, you cannot mine this. In Guyana, I was interviewing somebody from Barocara, and he said in 2005, they were taking punk notes of Terra out. The locals didn't know. They said, why are they taking Guyanese money? Why are they taking guidance and money? Not being aware of the fact that it is terapeutic, it, it is the most valuable um, soil, it's the most valuable legacy, African legacy in this country they didn't know. Right. So they considered it, these people coming up, they said they took pump loads and pump loads of terapeutic. I'm still trying to find out who did this. Yeah. Right. Because whoever did knew very well what it was. What it was. Mm -hmm. the, the, the person there had no idea this thing is money. So, but I have a project on the go now, and 
and, and, uh, and do some of that investigation, literally see how much you win. Your, in your connection is amazing. Because in the Kanji area, that is where, and the mid or east area, you missed the first part, you missed the presentation. But that area is the most African area. It has African history in terms of terra this, that goes back 5,000 years and beyond. All right, so it's not surprising that you have the people from West Africa. Roots, they were there before the, the, before the Mongols came to, 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 the, to the rest of the rest of world. Before the Mongols crossed the Garden Strip, so to speak. So that's how deep that African history is. And it's there. It's an African legacy. Go ahead. Siriki is the same soil, right? We found the mountain Siriki area, Pomeroon. Pomeroon, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But what I found, I went there, I climbed it, and I wanted to steal some, and I did when nobody was looking. <laughs> but I got the sense that the Armenian people there see it as sacred, and they were saying, no, 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 touch something. Like, it's, there's a superstition yeah. that something would happen Not to you, you if yeah. you touch it. Yeah. No. So they, well, again, the, but the people in, in, in the country. That's why I'm surprised to hear that. They were taking. Yeah. Yes, you don't know who was taking. You don't know. I don't know who was taking. Mm -hmm. But what was the component? Just a comment. Yeah, Professor Pansar, he spoke about the Armenian people and the worship in black statues. No, no, no. So anything related to black, the Armenians actually worship them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even to this day. So what's the so that's sacred. Yes. Yeah, no, I just want to come in relation to that. that there is a place on the Kanji as well, it's lower down before you get to Baraka, called Potoka. Potoka? Potoka. Potoka, okay. And Potoka is the eastern Indian world from Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so you have a, a location carrying the name. Yeah. And okay. what is it? <laughs> yes, it's terrible, but that entire that entire region, right, is, is I consider it to be an approach for that. It's, it's, a, it's an African heritage area. It has so much history. <laughs> could, could this be related to the humongous um, old neck heads that have They're all religious. Yes, yes, yes. 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 We talked about the wars and the old necks. Between the Mayans and the ancient yes. Egyptians, mm -hmm. that entire time was Africans were coming across from West Africa to the Americans, you don't hear that in, in, in history because they want you to believe that 1492 is the time Africans started to come here and that's when slaves started to come. Absolute nonsense. The history goes back from the ancient Egyptians. They built their own harbor so that you can come from Africa. And that's it. You don't, you don't do that if you're just stopping back. You build a harbor when you have the oil on ships, when you have a regular motor traffic coming, okay? when you're commercial. And this is underwater now, around 20 feet, which means the water level at the time was at that level, about 1,000 years ago. Right? And this is, but this is African history. This is African history. But this is also world history, which the world Intelligentsia will not, not tell it. Not it. No, no, but again, we find that up there. But if, when you tell them now, they'll go back and say, well, we knew something like that. But they will not tell you. You have to do the other questions. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, they came by small boats with different kinds of large boats. They, they came in large boats yeah, and large boats. Yeah, 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 yeah. The large boats and the large quantities. They had the technology, they had the technology, they had the, the will, they had the flair for, 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 for exploration. Everything that, that the European says the African is not now, that is exactly the US. They built civilizations all over this world. You knew that, you knew that, because when you looked at the, okay, I knew that, but then I said to somebody, they, Engineering mathematics of the pyramids is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, if you could have worked that math out all them centuries yeah. ago, you have me very, very that, that is why That method. is why we say, and that is made. why it's a legacy. And that's why the pyramid, when you look at it, 
is just like Terra Preta. We don't know how Terra, how Terra Preta works. Right? We just know that it works. And what we're doing is analyzing all a bunch of pieces and burning the soil because it's black. They burn the soil, say we make biochar, and then they don't burn it completely and they call it biochar, but it's not Terra Preta. Right? <laughs> and we're doing all sorts of things, but it is not Terra Preta. They okay. don't know. This we conversation so will go for a long time. Yeah. Thank yeah. you yeah. all. We have two other presenters and we have to stop the stand right now. You have been offered to yes, your activity yes, addressing it and it's to the MP. And I guess we will continue that discussion with him. Yes. Good afternoon. I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. I have to say, when I started graduate school to become a master in 2005, it was to answer the question of why were there statuary in South America with African features, why were there pyramids in Egypt, and also in, in Mesoamerica, and consider the trade winds. I, I I've been waiting for, to find someone who didn't think I was crazy for thinking that Africans had been there before. This is, so, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I can't tell you how much you miss um, what, I'm, what I'm going to do today is uh, present some information from a, a revision of a manuscript that is actually due to my publisher on July 10th. So I want to use this opportunity not just to teach, but also to get feedback from you. Because the book is, it's called uh, Heidi Osirami Berger, Identity and Resistance in the Dutch Guyana, 1763. 1823. And it discusses uh, the 1763 rebellion and the 1823 rebellion specifically, and the ways in which people of African descent had to resist and form their own identity in the result of in the in the face of outstanding uh, oppression and discrimination and attempts to control their bodies and their and their minds. And the, the, the connection that I make is that during the during the slave era, it people of African descent depended on other groups, uh, not just them, but other groups to help them. They had to have a sort of a network, a, a network of, of people who were sympathetic to their cause to resist effectively. And that's hence the title of my paper. Resistance on the Margins, Multicultural Coalitions, and the Dutch Colonial Plantocracy. And towards the end of the book, I discuss modern day Guyana. And the, 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 the topic of ethnic tensions today. And what I want to, what I would like to do is, uh, I've, I've done my you know, scholastic research, my secondary research, but what I think the book needs, what I know the book needs is voices of people from Guyana. Um, I, I would like to do ethnographies or interviews to put into this book because I, I don't want it to have a kind of scholastic, dry feel. I want it to have real voices and real opinions. So as I speak, at any time, if you sort of crinkle your brow up and say no, or that doesn't make sense, whatever, I implore you, before you leave, Grab my card, it's right there at the edge of the table. And please email me and let's start a dialogue because I want to get in, again, as many, as many present-day, authentic Guyanese voices as I can in this book. So, again, I, I, I want this to be an exchange. Amerindians were, were the first peoples enslaved in the New World by the colonial powers. But their high rates of mortality and fugitivism caused the plantation elite to begin to consider African slaves as a better labor investment. The Indian ethnic group that formed the most stable political alliances with the Dutch in the New World were known as Caribs in historical documents. Although today there's been a, an identity switch, and actually I would like some insight into this too if, any, if anyone uh, knows the history of when the people that were called Caribs in historical documents um, now choose uh, for the most part, be uh, referred to as Taino, people that were known as Arawaks, or no, I'm sorry, Kalanago, people that were known as Arawaks, who preferred to be known as Taino, 
uh, there's an aspect of identity, ethnicity, and also language, and scholars are sort of conflicted about it. So again, the insight into um, the the uh, what I'd like to find is the the opinions and the, the wishes and desires of, of native groups today that don't have access to. Uh, the names of these groups were referred to as Waini, uh, Akawoi, Arawaks, Warraos, Wapuisians, Manus, Pankayes, Pariakos, when they were not referred to by the generic term Indiana, uh, the Dutch word. It was early 1714 that the, the, Dutch West, the Dutch West India Company sent a directive to the commander of Esequibo prohibiting the trade in red slaves, they were called. Most likely because enslaving Indians decreased the Dutch chances of establishing political ties with them. The Spanish and next door Venezuela, after years, been attempting to build relations with the Arawaks over there through religious conversion, but had only been successful in convincing small pockets to agree to adopt the missionary lifestyle. So the Dutch started to make, they, they came to the conclusion that uh, the Caribs were unconvertible. You couldn't turn them into Christians, so they just decided to trade with them while the Spanish were trying to convert them uh, into Catholicism. <coughs> but it's true that Amerindians had... Where's my to? Oh, uh, how much time do I have total? 15? 15? Okay, I'm going to watch you. <coughs> Amerindians had better knowledge of their native land, and many Europeans surmise that African slaves' lack of connection to the natural world reduced their potential for revolution. One could even argue that their native connection to the land gave Amerindians an added incentive for fugitivism. New World Indians were surrounded by both a familiar natural environment as well as fairly pristine Amerindian communities to escape to and in which they could be reabsorbed. Again, something that, that Africans didn't have no access to a, a pristine community that they can escape to. Given that Africans and Indians and the Caribbean had somewhat different motivations for rebellion, the question arises what their relations were towards each other. We know about the African Indian conglomerations in St. Vincent and Dominica. In America, in the 1720s, Louisiana's, Louisiana's Natchez Indians teamed up with newly arrived African slaves to massacre over 200 French settlers. And the Florida Seminole Nation had always accepted outcasts. And the Seminole War that Andrew Jackson conducted against them uh, probably spilled as much African as Indian blood. But another form of solidarity created in the context of rebellion could be loosely defined as class solidarity, or a solidarity born out of circumstance. And this was the case with the Waini. They were neighbors to the Caribs, and they were witness to that group's rising fortune when they aligned with the Dutch. And since the Dutch used Caribs to control Amerindian populations as well as slave rebels, the Dutch used these Caribs as sort of a police force. But so the Wainis, who were fighting with the Caribs, became uh, a place where African slaves could uh, escape to. They, they, they harbored a lot of slave runaways. So you have this sort of coalition. Uh, when you escape, you need a place to go, and Waini provided that. Uh, a Dutch historian named Cornelius Kalsinga claimed that the Indian paths to the woods were unknown to black slaves. That was his quote, quote. But that seems highly unlikely. Amerindians played a vital role in the slave communication network. As far as the Saramaka balloons of Suriname are concerned, native groups have always been an invaluable resource for them. In one of their foundational oral histories, their hero, a runaway, was welcomed by Indians once he had gotten deep into the forest, who then, quote, took care of him and gave him food. A 1778 letter from Esequibo administrator suggests that Dutch officials might have been partly to blame for the establishment of these relationships. He says, there has been from former times on the company's plantations a very harmful custom of sending the slaves to the river of Orinoco and of sending different young ones with them to learn the salting of fish and the various manners and languages of the nations of Indians. Now the young ones know so thoroughly the root and the languages that I am obliged to wonder at. So they were wondering if they were doing, if they were smart by sending slaves into these, into these groups. But this had been going on forever, as long as it's been on forever, but as early as 1683, uh, the quote uh, from the, the same commander uh, is stormed on to the song that I heard of him before. He said, Negro traders were employed by the Dutch West India Company to travel among the Indians and obtain by barter the products of the country and to put an end to native wars on the Cuyun. 
The majority of slaves who escaped into the bush encountered a rude awakening upon their first exercise of freedom. Undoubtedly unable to truly grasp the scope of the vast expanse of the Atlantic, there was no way for them to know, to anticipate, that although it might look similar, the variety of natural selections dictated that the South American flora and fauna would have been very different from what they would have encountered in Africa. So they wouldn't have been able to recognize what fruits and vegetables were safe to eat and which would be poisonous, and they wouldn't have known the knowledge of the effects of getting the animals that they would have encountered. As a result, escaping to the Amazonian rainforest without knowledge about natural resources would have been quite a, a fraught existence for a runaway slave. And there's no doubt some would disappear into the bush and were never seen again. We have a, a, a quote attesting to this from um, uh, another Mexico governor. He said, these three Negroes, not knowing the way to Orinoco and being unskilled in the various languages of the Indians, were not able to discover Orinoco and were very hungry and fatigued and glad they were even captured. African descent people also made cultural choices that were largely the result of Indian influence. Indeed, one particular marker of beauty in the Caribbean traditions that they also achieved such status in the marine community that it became a milestone in a child's life. Um, a soldier in Suriname mentioned that <coughs> he called an accountable adornment of Carib girls at 10 or 12 years old were, were a kind of cotton garter around their ankles and the same under their knees, which being very tight and remaining forever, occasions are cast <coughs> to slow to an enormous degree by the time they are grown women and give their limbs a very odd and unnatural appearance. And room females likewise wore these cat bags as soon as they were ready to begin walking. Indian influence, uh, there's also Indian influence on maroon art. You have some, on, on the left you see a maroon stool, on the right a stool made by the YY. There are examples of similarities in canoe paddles and their handles, the way that they were painted. There's also a tradition amongst the rooms to tie thread between the tines of a comb and you see the similar uh, use in Native American groups. And so, oh, and there was one more that really, that really stuck out, and it was maroon religious totems. There's a, a, lo a lack of figural art in maroon culture. Again, on the, on the right, in fact, I'm On the right, you see a typical maroon religious figure, and on the left, you see some examples of, of African figural art. There's, there's no uh, real correlation of statuary, human-looking statuary in maroon culture. So this could have been something that, that was acquired from the native groups. Nicholas Duffy explains in, um, in, one, in a book that he wrote about this native group that the policy of figure of art is something that maroons share with native South American peoples. Though so just as spiritual as maroons and as best in the ideas that spirits live amongst them, few South American communities have felt the need to invest their beliefs in material like totems. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Slave communication networks in the Caribbean seem to incorporate members of every racial and social group. Although there's no evidence of verbalized complicity between whites and rebels, many of the actions of one of the proprietors, uh, a person named Birmingham from Demerara, suggest that there might have been some collusion. On April 3, 1763, Demerara, Demerara Governor Birchike reported in his journal that Mr. Birmingham had prevented the Creoles from catching the rebels who were at the plantation. Two days later, it seemed that Birmingham's obstinance only escalated. Uh, the quote was, the commander again went on the river with his assistant to give order that if not followed willingly, that it should be enforced with violence, and that if Mr. Birmingham does not want to hand, over them, hand them over or let them go, he would also be taken prisoner. 
By April 8th, it seems that Birmingham had forced the hand of the Dutch authorities, who reported that Mr. Birmingham and all his people had been taken prisoner. The term his people seems ambiguous as to the identity of the captives, but a subsequent entry from Birch Egg confirms that included in the congregation, Birmingham was protecting his prisoner slaves. Letter written by, letters written by Essex Hugo Governor Gravesand two months later give further details. He says that when trusted slaves tasked with the responsibility of finding rebels arrived at the Birmingham plantation, they showed Mr. Birmingham a written command, whereupon he, quote, refused immediately to leave from the plantation, saying his people had no need, with many unbecoming expressions which no white witness should consider. An October letter further details that when Birmingham refused to leave his plantation, he subsequently ordered the Creoles to abandon the plantation, which he did. The Creole officers were coming to arrest him. On succeeding days, Birmingham with a yacht and a canoe went sailing in the face of an oncoming vessel with a soldier standing on guard, not answering after three calls, whereupon he was told that if he did not answer, it shall be to his peril. When a commanding officer later questioned him as to the whereabouts of the rebels, Birmingham replied he didn't know. But when reminded of the orders from the commander to turn them in, he says, in the, he impertinently answered in the French which was spoken. This is a quote. He impertinently answered in the French which was spoken. I don't care for the orders of your commander. Uh, je je n'aime pas pour la order de la commander. Birmingham was arrested, but that was not the end of it. This uh, police tower, the person that was coming to uh, arrest him, not a client put him in shackles, but did so at the request of some of the important burgers. But when he did, a French burger armed himself with his rifle and the cartridge, saying he would no longer stand by. Gravesend reports that the main commander in Denmark had been telling the residents that, that the Birmingham rebels were not captured, all would be lost, and that they were already off to another plantation to stir up the slaves there. So the possibility that a major slave owner like Birmingham was complicit in the rebel designs of his slaves suggests the possibility that native whites, as well as free blacks, influenced by anti-slavery ideology, as well as being versed in the natural rights philosophy that had helped spark the Haitian Revolution, aided and abetted a multicultural slave communication network. The Birmingham incident is in fact one of the many instances of French complicity with slave rebellion. <clears throat> Although Birmingham was himself of Irish descent, he defied police powers or soldiers in French, and it was a French burger who tried to protest his being shackled in defiance of other burgers who requested it. We also have the example of a man named, a man named P. Kayar, a Frenchman on the plantation of Birmingham's son, Edward, who was caught actively helping the rebels in 1772 by secretly handing the guns and powder to the rebels out of the window, despite being well watched by colonial defenders. In addition to slaves receiving news today from white elites, the historical record also indicates that it was well known that slaves received information from members of other marginalized groups. These groups could be specifically members of the same European, the lumpen proletariat who carved out new democratic spaces in America, in the Americas on their way to forging the essence of what I call the New Atlantic World Citizen, a world where one could erase themselves from European social hierarchies, mobilize and demand the same natural rights as any man or woman. I'm going to skip ahead to one example of, these, of this group. Quarantine River, 
and switched over and joined the rebels and started helping them by giving them military advice and uh, tactical advice. So again, soldiers and sailors, it's it's my belief that a, a lot of these, a lot of especially the French soldiers and sailors, were part of the part of the group of French that fought during the American Revolution. Um, and after you know that was over, 1776, that some of them went back to France, but I think some of them sort of spread out over the, the New World and spread some ideas of natural rights and liberté, egalité, and fraternité, the idea of the French Revolution that subsequently became a part of a French consciousness. Okay, I'm going to take two minutes to hit my last my last section and I'll be finished here. <clears throat> so now we telescope a little bit into the into the present day. Again, after we looked at instances in which these in which groups of people, especially marginalized groups, influenced or allied with African rebels. Having begun a system of conquest and indoctrination in India in 1757, the British by the 1840s had wrested control of the Indian subcontinent for most of its native rulers. During that decade, the British began shipping East Indian labor to Guyana with a promise of fair pay and a return voyage home. Between 1842 and 1848, the British had imported 32,000 Asian laborers. Neither of those promises were kept, however, as the majority of these Indian immigrants to Guyana were forced to work in labor camps on the colony sugar plantations. Although this might have seemed like an opportunity for blacks and East Indians to form collegial bonds while working together on the plantation to avoid being exploited by the British, large numbers of former African slaves had already begun migrating to the colony's coastal cities. Similar to the United States, American blacks leaving the South during the Great Migration and bereft of a viable maroon community in Guyana, Guyanese blacks believed that abolition meant progress and progress meant getting off the plantation. This created a geographic divide as well as a cultural divide between the two major ethnic groups. Ethnic antagonism, however, was not a significant social problem until Guyana's elite business class tried to exploit one group in order to control the other. After determining that going to cost production was the only way to save Guyana's certain insurance industry, the colony's planters passed a series of rules and regulations in 1842 to control the terms of labor. In protest, MRR's black leaders kept their laborers idle, having the same effect as a, a, a labor negotiation tactic of petite marinage. It was basically a strike, and it worked. But this tactic had a much weaker effect during another strike, that's the Kibo, six years later, 1848, by which time the British had imported East Indian labor. Mutually agreeable terms could not be reached because the new American class agreed to work for newly lowered wages, the uh, equivalent of a scab labor force. The new workforce made it very difficult for black laborers to withhold labor as a tactic of negotiation, and this strike became far more violent than the one in 1842. This ethnic tension went on to become Guyana's singular point of social disruption. And what is worse, neither group was the cause of the other's problems. After World War II, a British initiative entitled the Moyne Commission released a report determining that the root cause of Guyana's social and economic under underdevelopment lied in British administrators' unwillingness to incorporate blacks and East Indians into central positions of governance, leaving them fundamentally unprepared for roles as, as administrators in a Western-style bureaucracy. And I'm going to sort of wrap it up there. Um, we, we, we know later on how political leaders were able to exploit the ethnic tension that was already there, especially the conflict between labor and this geographical divide. And as I was mentioning before, what I'm, what I'm looking for primarily is insight into what the root causes of ethnic tension are, is it overblown? A lot of scholars are saying that it's this something that is um, that can't be solved, can't be resolved. But I, I'm starting to suspect that a lot of it, a lot of the cultural divide only sort of comes up during election time. But it's but normally people are people have um, fairly uh, peaceful cultural relations. So, um, in the past, multicultural coalitions were vital to the success of people of African descent. 
And it's my belief, or at least my presumption, that that will help bring Diana together in the future. taken by the state that left Africans at the bottom of the ladder. And I can give you that because it's documented in this book here. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that oftentimes we look at the conflict between Africans and Indians and we miss the fundamental issue which is an economic issue. And that issue will only become wider with oil 
because Africans today don't have any capital. The, uh, the PPP in the last 23 years gave the greatest transfer of wealth from state to Indian community. And so now you have the 13 Indian families dominating the economy. So Munishwar can get an oil fuel base. They all have the oil blocks. So, and that economic issue is what's going to make a big, uh, continue the conflict because it's a conflict about economics, not about culture. Thank you. Is there any other observation or question before we take our third president presenter? Okay, the debate will continue through email, etc. Our third presenter makes no introduction. Regular face on TV around. Dr. David Hines is going to be doing a presentation on political <coughs> issues, specifically in respect of Africa, the African Society for Cultural Relations with Independent Africa. And you will see how this presentation is going to be of the, some of the stuff, the stuff that we have already. Yeah, <coughs> very good secrets. Right, yeah. Thanks, thanks, and thank you for um, coming to the panel. Um, this work on ASCRI is um, part of a, a larger work that I'm doing on the recent political history of Guyana. And um, uh, ASCRI is an important organization in uh, the period from the 1950s to the present, often because our political history is dominated by uh, political parties and consideration of political parties, we often miss the role, the roles that are played, that were played by um, non-political party organizations. Uh, and as for this one, such organization. I think in, in uh, Looking at the history of ASCII, looking at the evolution of ASCII, there are three factors that need to be taken into consideration. First factor um, is the, the political choices that uh, were made uh, in the late 1950s by AUC Kwayan, who was the de facto leader uh, of ASCII. Uh, the second factor had to do with the ethnic conflict that developed in the early 1960s. And thirdly, uh, the rise of black power in the 1960s. Um, ASCO is unique in Caribbean black power organizations in the sense that it predated the black power organizations. Caribbean black power organizations arose out of the Walter Rodney riots of 1968. Uh, but ASCO was founded in 1964. Um, uh, and and uh, just a quick, a quick uh, kind of bio data. As we're in the peak of its uh, of its existence between 1964 and 1974, it's estimated that it had about 3,000 members at its peak. It had 32 what they call compounds. Although leaders of Asper at the time uh, have, have indicated to me that there may have been uh, many more than 32 compounds because people were in the habit of forming aspirin compounds on their own without, uh, 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 without uh, telling the head office. So there were um, lots of compounds that were uh, discovered later on. Uh, Aspirin, um, uh, uh, and uh, its membership was mostly between the ages of 18 and 40, so it had a relatively youthful membership. It also had a lot of overlap in its membership with the PNC. Um, Professor Green found that, uh, for example, 58% of PNC members in Abari uh, belong to ASCO, 35% uh, of PNC members in New Amsterdam belong to ASCO, 29% um, in Saudi uh, belong to ASCO. And as, uh, uh, as, as, as you move closer to the city, 
uh, those numbers were higher. So there was a lot of overlap between uh, PNC members and, and Asperger. When Asperger was founded, it's, um, there were three objectives. Uh, the first objective was the revival of African culture in Diana through the teaching of African history, politics, and philosophy. Second, uh, the revitalization, sorry, the revital, this revitalization was stimulated by among African Guyanese in their uh, African heritage. The second objective was to persuade African Guyanese to return to the land through institutionalization of populations. And the third objective was the establishment of links with independent African countries and other organizations. I'm arguing that ASCREL was a cultural organization, but it was a cultural organization that functioned more like a political movement. And it had tremendous impact on uh, the politics of the, of, of, of the time. Let me go back to the first objective, which um, which, which, which is the revival of African culture through the teaching of African history, politics, and philosophy. The politics there is important. Uh, 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 most uh, cultural organizations, of course, stress history and philosophy, but um, didn't um, stress politics. Um, Asker's um, stress politics. And um, Asker, between 1964 and 1974, as I will. Uh, show a little in a little bit uh, uh, was integral in political organization and, 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 and political movement of the time. The, the second objective was the revival of African culture. Sorry, uh, the the return of uh, uh, to the land stimulated the return of the land, the return to the land by African Chinese through cooperatives. What is not known is that the Cooperative Republic, the term Cooperative Republic, was suggested by Ascaret and PNC. Um, Mr. Burnham, and I'm reporting here from Guyana, who I've been interviewing for the last 20 years, um, said Mr. Burnham called him and, and, and asked for a meeting and said, we're moving towards a republic and we were wondering what to call the republic. And Mr. Guyana said, he told him, well, you know, the cooperatives, you know, people, um, develop it over a period of time, and you should consider that. And in Guyana's own, um, on the way, he said, you know, two days later, the Prime Minister was on the radio saying that ours shall be the cooperative republic. Um, Askren um, was responsible for um, the fact that we call um, that the cooperative republic. The third objective, the establishment of links with independent African countries and other African organizations. The PNC government of 1964 to 1992 played a really pivotal role in terms of African liberation and making links between the Caribbean and Africa. Uh, uh, what is not well known is that after the party came to power in 1964, um, uh, Mr. Burnham asked Mr. Guyana, and I'm reporting on my personal interview with Guyana, to become Guyana's first ambassador to the United Nations. So Guyana said he asked the Prime Minister if he looked like a diplomat, <laughs> that his place is at home. And he volunteered, he volunteered to go to Africa and to sensitize African countries to um, the PNC and Mr. Burnham because most of the African leaders had supported the PPP and Chagan from an anti-imperialist socialist perspective. And that Mr. Burnham and the PNC were seen as um, uh, kind of antagonistic to socialism and so forth. <clears throat> visited 13 African countries on that visit and um, introduced them to Guyana and, um, and, and, and when he came back, Guyana established diplomatic relations with all of those countries and more country, and, and, and other countries. Uh, uh, the, 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 the government was very pivotal in terms of um, lending actual solidarity and material resources to um, African liberation, uh, in, in especially in Southern Africa. Lots of um, the ANC freedom fighters um, traveled to the rest of the world in Guyanese passport. Um, there they, they were allocations in, Guyanese, in the Guyana budget every year 
um, for support. And um, when Mr. Kwaida was going to Africa, he took a collection of 50 pounds um, uh, at, at a meeting at the Tipperary Hall in Boston and delivered those 50, that, that money to the African liberation fighters. That was Guyana's first monetary contribution to African liberation and insisted when he came back that Guyana, he suggested that Guyana make a monetary contribution. Again, the direct influence of Askren Guyana to a policy um, that, uh, that Guyana has become uh, well known for. Uh, the relationship between Askren and PNC um, is an interesting relationship. Uh, it was a supportive relationship. Uh, uh, in 1964, when Askren was born, uh, uh, Askren leaders in Guyana, in particular, report that um, many people approached them to contest the 1964 election. Mr. Guyana, according to him, went to see the Prime Minister and told him what uh, the pressures they were having to contest the election. He said the Prime Minister told him that would not be wise, it would split the African vote, and um, that was enough for Mr. Guyana to um, reject the um, suggestions that Askria should contest the 1964 elections. Asprey, on the other hand, um, Asprey instead mobilized supporters um, and African people to vote for the PNC in 1964. In fact, the very first act of Asprey um, after being formed in 1964 uh, were twofold. One, they wrote to African countries asking for military help um, for Africans in the in the ethnic conflict that was going on, because the claim was that uh, the East Indian faction um, had gotten military help from Cuba, and um, African countries had a responsibility to, um, to help Africans in the context of the ethnic conflict. The second act was uh, a one-man vigil held by Mr. Kwan in front of the, uh, the residents of the Gofno, um, uh, to protest the <coughs> beatings and killings of Africans on the west coast of Demerara. Um, by 1968, by 1968, uh, tensions had begun to um, emerge between the between Ascre and the PNC. Ascre supported the PNC at the 19. 68 election, quite himself campaign for the PNC. Later it was emerged that those elections were massively rigged and um, Asperia um, took a stand. One of the most powerful Asperia compounds was in Linden. And Linden then became the theater of um, the theater of a lot of political action beginning in 1968. There were, there were 47 strikes between 1962 and 1971 uh, in, in Linden. Of those 47 strikes, 43 were called by workers independent of the union. And as Korea members were very much part of the organization or organizing of those strikes. Um, there were several strikes that were called uh, by Asprey during that period. Um, one strike was uh, what they called the, uh, the Conrad Gila uh, Fair. Um, this was a staff member who was suspended in January 1971 after a female employee accused him of raping her. A charge that was not substantiated by the evidence of workers present. The workers um, reacted by calling a strike, which was followed, a wildcat strike, which was then followed by a general strike, which has received the support of an estimated 5,000 workers. Um, uh, Asprey also called another strike with the OEN Young Affair. Um, this was a white. Uh, a, a white official of then Denver who was caught 
in the women's quarters um, naked uh, and the nurses complained and there was not any um, there was not there was not any any uh, retribution on the part of any discipline sorry on the part of the leadership of Denver and uh, Asprey called a 24 hour strike which um, closed down uh, the company. Um, later on, uh, uh, there was what was called the Rider Strike. This was after the nationalization of Dembo, and uh, the government wanted, the government by then, of course, the PNC government, um, uh, wanted to appropriate the, uh, the, the contributions the workers were um, making to their insurance. And the workers um, did not want that, and Asprey called a strike which lasted for three weeks. Um, okay. So um, that, that, that's just a snapshot of how uh, 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 an organization that was not a political party was able to, in a sense, act very much like a union and a, a political party. Uh, the next big, the next big campaign of Asprey was against corruption. That is familiar to us to me. Corruption has now become a household word. Um, and Asprey launched a campaign against corruption and called on the Prime Minister to, um, uh, for a code of conduct for government ministers because it had been receiving complaints of corruption in official circles. When the government did not comply, Guyana brought a charge um, against two ministers before the Ombudsman. Um, the Ombudsman found the ministers guilty um, and the report was sent to the Prime Minister. Um, no action was taken. Um, one of the ministers was sent as an ambassador to China. Another one was moved from one ministry um, to, uh, to, another, to another ministry. Uh, but, but, but the campaign against corruption uh, took root in this society. Um, the society. The next big campaign of Asprey was what was called the Land for the Landless campaign. And this had to do with the lands that were being left behind by the um, by Bukhars. And Asprey um, encouraged Africans and Indians to squat on the land. And it was estimated that almost 25,000 people squatted on those lands. Um, uh, eventually, the government sent in the army to evict the people from the land. Um, by this time, the conflict between Asprey and the PNC had got to the point where there was an official break between um, Guyana and Mr. Gordon. Three years later, Asprey would join uh, with Ratun the Working People's Vanguard Party, and the Indian People's Revolutionary Associates to form the Working People's Alliance. Um, uh, in a sense, it's just a snapshot. But I think the lesson we see here, first of all, is that ASPIRO was a mass-based African organization. All the other African organizations were not mass-based. From uh, Prior to that, we had the Garveyite organization, we had the League of Colored People, um, laterally, we come to the present, we have ASCO, we have ACTA, we have Coffee 250, the others. What distinguishes ASCO from all of those organizations? I was one that it was mass based, it was a membership organization around the country. Second, that it was ideologically working class. Um, ASCO did say that it, um, it, 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 it subscribed to socialism. Um, third, um, that it actually played a role in the actual day-to-day -day politics of the society. Um, in that regard, it, um, it is a unique um, Africanist organization in Guyana. I would say that a lot of it had to do with, one, the time. It was a period of black power, of um, black empowerment, heightened um, uh, black power, we know that we had the Rodney Rights in 1968 in Jamaica, we had the February Revolution in Trinidad in 1970, and we had uprisings all over the Caribbean. Uh, 
most of those, if not all of those of, um, black power organizations went on to become political parties um, in the region. And so in that sense, ASPE was no different when it um, morphed other organization to form a political uh, party. Uh, uh, but I think, I think the, overriding, the overriding influence of ASPE had to do with its leader or the coordinating elder, um, Kwame. Um, uh, uh, Kwame did not start off as a black powerist. In fact, Dr. Chagano referred to him as a Simon Q. Marxist. And it was not until 1956 when, when, when Dr. Chagano, in 1956, when the PPP refused to take Guyana into the, uh, the federation um, of the time, Remember the Federation of 1915-1962 and Dr. Chagall and the PPP who were in power at the time refused to take Ireland into the Federation. And the argument is that um, Indians indicated that they would become second class citizens in a Federation. And so therefore there was a second split in the PPP, we love the first split in five, but there was a second split when Guyana, Martin, Carter, Rory, Westmus and other Africans and Brown members of the PPP leadership. Hello. This is distracting. Yeah. Other members of that leadership broke from the PPP um, on the question of federation. And Kwayana announced that if Mr. Jagan was basing uh, 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 his politics on the thinking of East Indians, then he was left with no alternative but to organize Africa. And he first joined the PNC, became his general secretary, and was responsible for the early building of party groups around the country. He fell out of the PNC on the race question, because in 1961 he opposed Guyana going to independence under the PPP, and argued instead for what he called joint premiership between Mr. Burnham and Mr. Jagger, um, with, with partition as a last resort. We know of the partition, but not the joint premiership. Um, and on that score, the PNC expelled him for what they called racism. He then formed what was called the, uh, the African Society um, for Racial Equality, ASRA, along with H.H. H. Nicholson. And um, Tom Dalgetty, as a student of Nicholson, was a founding member of ASRA. And ASRA began to do the kind of work that, that ASRA eventually did. Um, it folded in 1962 on the request, according to Kwayana, of Mr. Burnham, said that Azri's presence was confusing Africans, and so Azri um, closed down. And two years later, um, Kwayana formed Asprey when he felt, um, according to him, that uh, Africans were defenseless in the civil war that was going on, and therefore they needed an organization to um, to defend to, to defend them. That's all. We have we have had another mouthful, and since this presentation was much more current, you know the problem is that we get gets into the more recent period. Objectivity begins to be a kind of problem. And so we do know that some of what was mentioned here in respect of the development of Aspen is still out there as a matter of today. We know, for instance, the whole question of the issue of Ghana's non involvement in federation. I don't think that we will ever have a conclusion. Um, I have been involved at the end of the was a Massachusettsist, and that's why he was able to stand vigil outside the state house and I locked him up. The man saw him in his bathroom, you know that story? Yes, yes. Right? The government said, Lucy, Lucy! <laughs> you know, highly spiritual. However, I think Kwayana had a real great role to play in this sustainable situation that we live. 
I mean, should do some more and hoping that when you finish writing whatever you're writing, that we will be able to share that with you. Because we still look to him as an elder in terms of things that are. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, in terms of what all the speakers said, you want me to tell them? Yes, in um, Dr. Nicky's presentation, I am just, that is very interesting, I'm just curious to know whether it is part of uh, Latin American historical outgrowth of scholarship now, because I've, I again call here a little flash drive, and I have a friend who is, she has a doctorate in history, and I think put it in Latin American history. And I passed on to her because I was interested. I would, before he said Brazil had done something, I was interested to know whether the Latin American countries were involved in this scholarship. But it seems that it, that is so. But well, that's a very, very interesting bit of information. Um, the Dr. Jameson, um, after Mr. Barry Phillips school. I must say that as I'm not a historian, I'm not an ordinary guidance person, but I've been lived so long and being conscious of um, my, my, as my time can pass in here, I recognize that African culture, culture that has been, been embraced by African guidance people has a role to play in our economic situation. Our, economic position that we occupy right now. And um, that is, occupies a lot of my, my life's work. And of course, we don't, I don't want to go into details here. I know a lot of us know the situation. And there's lots of work that we have to do to correct that situation. Um, what I want to say is that as we recognize history is made every day, all the things we do here every day, go into our history. And what I can tell you, what I'm dissatisfied about is that when people are trying to get things done, for example, economic and economic work, getting things done, we have to pay attention to how we record and we and preserve history. And I mean records that are kept, for example, I find it difficult in Guyana you can lose your livelihood and lose a lot of your economic in, uh, should I say, whatever direction you want to go in because of the fact that the records and things are not being stored properly. And even a simple birth certificates you can't get easily. You go to the registry, to the law registry, you can't get information. You go to the land and service, you can't get information. You, I, mean, I have heard stories where, for example, there are important plans you can't find. There's a particular plan for Puerto Rico. Years ago, I heard it was this, it, someone was charged with having stolen it. And recently, I've been told that when the registry was being, break, uh, should I say, they were reorganizing the beef registry, and all the plans that were lodged there were put in bags and take them to the lands and surveys, and they're still in bags they wow. have not been sorted out. And it's possible that that, that plan may be there. But I just want to say that we must pay the people. In 1936 records, you can't find at the archives. And I think there's someone here in this room who has told me a um, very gory story about how a certain professional handle um, should I say legal um, records? We we we'll talk about we we'll talk of person to person about it later. But I think we need to pay attention to how we record our history and how we preserve our history. Um, I was born in '93, so I'm a baby. But um. Recent, I'm a second year student of UG, I'm doing history, and then I get to do research, then I get to understand what we have lost as a people, and I 
um, all, all that I brought the book, Made in Guyana, to me. And I searched all for this book, and I can't find it. And he brought it, he just lent me it for two days. So he can't let me long because of somebody's book. And I'm saying that we need to preserve the records, right? We need to preserve the records. And young people need to know a lot of things. Like you spoke about Austria. I've never heard of that, never. And I'm going to go and do my research. And in terms of Burnham and his contribution, I've never heard of anything about it other than going to the archive because Dr. Eiffel instructed us went to the archive and I did my research. So I think young people need to be aware of some of the contributions these great men have made to Guyana. And it needs to be done through television programs and the internet. Because young people have moved away from the whole reading of books to the whole social media. Thank you. This is a young all I want to say is, since the event declared the day, I've been saying, well, we need some system to allow them to get into the other. We can't do the task because it's a very circum to get a visa. So I would like to note it that I'm not asking questions, I'm just saying, can we release some office in there that allows the release of visas to do this all over to do this thing? Does it make it a finish? Are you still in the confusion? We can't get to Africa. Then, then, then if we say we have harbor, I, I, I mean, I could eat. <laughs> On the subject. <laughs> Because that means there's another movement. But that is how many years ago. So, you know, and we know in a decade, and we still are not easily. They come and say, I'd like to move on to the next month. Because if you know, they come down and they come to the next discussions going on between CARICOM and the OU, African Union, on that issue on the agenda, and I think Ethiopia just made it um, easy for any one of African descent to go to Ethiopia without a visa, but that's going on. Coming back to the early discussion, I'm from Maikoni, and I think there are a lot of things happening in Maikoni that's been lost in history that needs to capture, to recapture. But beyond that, I think we're losing our historians, our oral history, and there are a lot of people in villages with lots of stories that we're not capturing, they're dying, and we're losing because of that. So I don't know if there's anything that this society can do to rekindle that. I mean, this young lady's in history, and a lot of things she hasn't heard about. And there's a tremendous amount of stuff. And the decade should be used to capture some of this. Um, so I'm hoping that, um, like what Jamaica did, Jamaica has a one-hour program every Saturday, Professor Reed Shepard called Living History. And she tries to go back into time to have on radio history of Jamaica so that Jamaicans could start to understand their identity and also the issues. And I think a lot of this needs to be done now because it's getting too late. In fact, I understand very much the issue of, of, of the visa problem. We married to Trinidadian who could go to Ghana without a visa. And when I arrived here, I have to pay a few hundred US dollars to get a visa to what is traveling in the same place, sleep in the same house for the last maybe 50 years. But that distinction is there. That's one thing. But the issue of oral history and oracy, I think we have not paid, and this is why I was particularly glad for this last presentation here. We have not paid sufficient attention to that. We are an oral culture. And a lot of information is passed on in that format. And we have got to learn how to, to capture that information, to interrogate it, and to ask the right question. So we need a structured situation in which we will start approaching um, the resources in a very um, organized way. Um, 
history departments, the history department of UG over the years had a very big uh, and very strong actually written records kind of orientation, but never really a very strong oral records orientation. And it seems to me that the structure has got to involve getting the department and the students into these areas. Two people from Maikoni, one person from Belize, like one and all over the place. Um, these are the people who know. Uh, Florine has been talking, I mean, I remember when Florine's father's hair was the color of her hair. <laughs> and and then these are people who will have stories, who will have information, um, and I'm afraid they're passing. I lost a cousin recently who could give me information of my great, great, great grandfather. You know, so we need to get that kind of action going and the time is now. I mean, I look like this and I grew up in a family where blackness was dominant, but not dominating. Because, I mean, Terry Stewart is my cousin's wife, but Terry, whenever Terry see me, she's a high Chinese. So we grew up with that without sensing any hostility from Africa or any attempt to overpower us as Chinese. And my father was the best, my black father was the best Chinese cook in the family. He could cook Chinese food better than my mother. So, I mean, that relationship between a minority race, the Chinese, in my very family, where blackness was dominant, was with no, I don't know what to say it, but I don't, I don't know why we are having this issue now, or this other thing. Um, Eric brings up the economic forms, which is the crucial aspect of Somehow we have to work through that. Because, I mean, the fact is that African people are no longer a numerical majority. But there was a time when there was a sense that they were on some par in numbers with East Indians. But at, and it was at that time when you did not have the hostility. Yeah. I don't know if I'm only speaking about my own personal But you don't have, because you have more numbers, it does not necessarily with domination. Right. You understand what I'm saying? I'm glad you raised that because yeah. one of Asker's lasting contribution is to bring race out <coughs> of the open. Guy needs to be hypocritical when it comes to race. We, 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 we have extreme racial tensions. I mean, I tell you, I go, I go, I talk to black people all the time. They feel free to come to tell me. And I can't repeat some of the things they tell me about how they feel about East Indians and other races. So don't fool ourselves. Eh? Um, our problem is economic. Eric is right. It started as economic. But what started as economic has now become racial. All right? So although Indians and Africans didn't enslave each other, we are not historical enemies, but we, we carry out our ethnic relations within the context of race as if we were historical enemies. Yeah. All right? So uh, what I, one, one of the things that Asper did was to bring race out into the open and in a sense empowered Africans to feel confident about their quote unquote race so that they could begin to speak. Guyana did say that he, he, he thought he made a mistake in the 60s and that is that he felt all Indians were the problem. And so therefore later on in, in the 1970s he sought to correct that. Um, in the sense that, in the sense that that that, that it's not it's not Indian masses, um, but the Indian elite and the masses, in a sense, feed off or feed off of off, off, off of that. Um, so, so the question of race. I mean, we are right back to square one, right? Where we need another intervention like Asprey, right, to bring this racial thing out into the open. Let's speak about it. I mean, we're never going to solve our ethnic and racial problems if we don't actively spoke about it. I mean, this is Walter Rodney's major contribution. Whereas Guyana spoke 
to Africans, and Moses Bagwan spoke to Indians, Rodney was able to bring them together in the street corners, bring them together in the picket line, and spoke to them together. And that is always aspirational, but we've got to talk about it. Okay, one more attention about the race thing. I'm seeing it very vividly at UG as a lecturer. Um, and it's so much attention on silence rather than on mm -hmm. the overt internalism. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I jump on this real quickly? Um, <clears throat> I, I think an important thing to remember also is the way that we foreground race as a viable category. A viable category of human distinction, right? We have to remember that the only reason we started talking about race was during the slave trade, when Europeans said, we are white people and you are black people, oh, and the rest of the people are Asian and these people are uh, Indian or, or whatever. But they set up these categories and they've made it something that now we're making it, you know, be be something that's that's real. But again, if you look at a lot of our, of our children, especially the way that they're developing relationships, Race isn't a thing that, for the most part, unless we sort of drive it into them, a thing that they see as distinguishing between each other, especially as we're having growing biracial populations. I think we really have to look at how useful concepts of race are for us. When they empower us, we have to be aware of them empowering us, but when they are, again, serving as points of division, um, to, you know, how, how useful are they? Right? How useful is that concept? The race is not biologically real. Exactly. That's but what it I'm is saying. politically and economically real. Okay. And right. I think it's you have to make that, 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 that distinction. Right? Right. Ian yeah. this morning reported what Walter Rodney said. Um, that, 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 that it's white people who made them black. And he right. went on to say that if you want to use my color to dehumanize me, I will use my color to humanize myself. So, you know, if, when it comes to race, we have to be very careful when we say race is not real. It's a very real thing, economically and politically. Biologically, no. No, I you know, absolutely it is that filtering. I'm, I'm saying we have to be aware also when it's being exploited. Can I add one of the comments from the young lady here? Um, in 2018, ignorance, and I'm not saying it to you specifically, but in general, ignorance is a choice. Right. With the media, with all the information that's available, with all the options that one has, people decide to not study history. I was at um, I was in the Palmer Room just a few days ago, a few weeks ago, and it was a, a little um, show where people, the kids, were asked to dress in their cultural attire and come out on stage and say something about themselves and then go back. So the only person who is visibly ashamed of who that person was is the African young lady. Right? They came out, they had their African attire, and then afterwards they walked and they stood behind the mic and they actually stood down and said, oh my God, you know, you, they didn't say it because it's the body that we said, I am, I am this stage. The point is, the information to change that is available. The people are not conscious enough, the adults, the young people are not conscious enough, and therefore don't make the decision to, 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 to expand that horizon. Eh? So, I say that to say there are methods to do this, but it is the individual. You know, Michael Jackson says you have to, the changes with the man in the mirror. That person, you've got to look in the mirror and it starts with you. How you do that, though, there are already are mechanisms set up and people are doing this. You start cultural circles and you meet once a month. You get five or six of your friends who are like-minded and you start a cultural circle. It starts with you. So there's no point saying, well, we don't know how we can get these children to teach anything. You have to change yourself. And then you inspire others to change, right? But it is a process that it just, we didn't just start here, you know. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of history that brought us to this point. Effort, money, brainwashing, 
and it's still, and this is the point, it still is operative. The people who were wanting to enslave you in 1492 exist. They're still there. All you're doing is getting more sophisticated. Don't think they've gone away and become all liberals and they're all, they still exist. And their intention is still the same, to get into your head and destroy it. You have to, you have to, as young people particularly, take the initiative to realize that this is the nature of your existence. You have to group yourselves in little groups and then get bigger groups and understand that you are in a war for your own mind. It is not a trivial thing because colonialism is not ending. It hasn't ended. Look at what's happening in Africa today. Look at what's happening all over the world. This is what's happening in the United States. But you have to be conscious and realize, as Michael Jackson says, look at the man in the mirror, because that's where the real change happens. You change yourself, and then, and that is a decision. That is nobody coming with information and Professor Hines and, no. It is you saying, look, I'm going to study African history. I'm going to get like-minded people. I'm going to get, you know, Professor Phillips. I'm going to get Tracy, and we're going to get it. Ask them to come and visit. You want to start a small group and start a process. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight. This, this one's final comment. World Cup stuff is going on. And it doesn't really, this shows how history is hidden from us. Argentina has no black player. The only country in Latin America in the Caribbean with no black player. Do you know what happened to blacks in Argentina? They killed them purposely. And that is hidden from us. But we are supporters of Argentina. It's, it's amazing how these things are there, but we don't see them because. Do you wonder why no black player? No, but, yeah. but that, you have to, um, I need to emphasize that because the question that you were talking about, right? the only country that is absolutely set on trying to keep blacks out of it is Argentina. Yeah. Everybody else is involved in the current state of knowledge because all the other countries have significant black populations. And they're finding out that their roots are blacker than they are anything else. I don't, I don't mean that trivially black, or I mean substantively black. Argentina has been where a lot of the Germans went yeah. after, the, after the war. And they made a decision that they're going to get rid of the black race. And this is why Argentina football team has, has won. There was a time when you couldn't, people would not buy Argentina butter, right. flour, sugar, nothing that, is, that comes out of Argentina, they would buy it because Right. But Argentina is a very special case, and it's the only country in Latin America yeah. today that has that depth of racism. All the other countries the organization are doing the research, people are then defining themselves as a greater percentage ethnically African. Because if you realize the history, and this is something you can't deny, as you, as you understand the depth of your history, that changes how you interact with, with yourself, your peers, with everybody. Uh, I come back to the story of the young lady. That young lady, if she had known a, a penny of what Eric writes about, and he's got a book on Africa, if he, just a little bit, she would have been standing up going, look man, <laughs> this is who I am, right? As but opposed to but how great I teaches. The that. teachers, no, the teachers themselves don't know. So Just the like the, of education no, you have to understand the ministries. Right now, we are trying to get, and you are part of that. We are trying to get the, 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 the educational program to include African history. It does not include African history. The lady does, the young lady doesn't know about Burnham. The last, you don't understand what has happened over the last almost well, six, specifically 23 years. That has been, it has been a serious attempt to destroy and remove African history from every place, including the cooperative, the cooperative we had. They have tried to remove the name cooperative out of the cooperative republic. And President's Right, so 
we need to understand the depth of the effort that's been, that has been made to, to destroy the black community, to, to remove black history, right? And this is why it's important we, that we need to sit down and realize it is not arbitrary, as, 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 as um, uh, Professor was saying there. These are real things that they have very real, and people are seriously working to destroy. Right? And it's not new. This didn't just start. It is not new, but we somehow don't want to, in, to, to acknowledge that there is this issue. But it is real. In, in Egypt today, the, the, the poor guys were saying, take pictures of what you're taking out. Because tomorrow if you come back, it's not going to be there. Right? Which means for a thousand years, the Egyptians have been trying to remove Egypt even though it's impossible because the pyramids say <laughs> this is Africa, right? But they, they still do that. Understand the depth and the nature of the cancer that has been trying to eat the African society. Out. Everybody is trying to destroy Africa. But everybody is. But if we are a worse enemy. Yeah. We are worse than it. We do not want to look in the mirror and say, I am going to spend some time to understand more about me. And unless we do that, unless the teachers, or the teachers are not going to be taught by the, the white people. No, There are books, a lot of books, but the, you know, the book doesn't read itself to you. You have got to pick up the book. You have got to pick up. They came before Columbus. You've got to pick up the, the, the um, Africans were the first Americans and read it. They they have got to. These young people have got to avail themselves of the information that is there. The competition, and this is not accidental, is this thing. Here. Somebody comes out of the bathroom. They go to the toilet, they come to the bus. This, you have to put, and this is serious, this is, the, this is the nature of the warfare. If they can occupy six hours a day of you doing this, you have no time to learn history. And this is why we say ignorance is a choice. If you choose to do this six hours a day, that is your choice. Don't talk about nobody's teaching you. The information is available. People have dedicated their lives to write serious material about African history. But and we have, you know, several in, in, in this room, we have several Guyanese. Um, Ivan Van Serten, George G.M. James. You know, we have people who have made massive contributions. We have to do, take the time and decide. It is our decision, there is no excuse. Ignorance today is a choice. If you choose to do this, don't talk about African history you won't know. Dr. Maliki, there is an irony here. We have had, there have been three Guyanese who have changed the world changed the in terms world. of African history. Walter Rodney, John D. M. James, and Ivan Rodney. And we don't, even know about no, they, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, and exactly. And this, and this again, this is something that at all levels we need to yes. and form a circle get together as groups but it's not going to don't expect anybody to do it for you okay you have to look in the mirror and say you you in the mirror i'm going to make a difference and then do it okay before we wind up you had come a long time ago you had to wait a very long time for it I've seen this, it's very clear, it's very
PPP and PNC are those intermixes after different groups. We also know that is it, but we know that black is a black and white will always be the same. And in some books say that the black population was the first person on the face of God in certain books, certain history books. So it's, and then again, if you might wait to America, sometimes it can get clearer. You might change when you come back to the island. People want to know what color you are. It's, it's all the same difference. So, so that is another problem. Eh? So we have to go by Christian and we have to go with love. You know, and, and we have to bond with love. Because there will always be this stuff here. The black will look superior or not superior, inferior to the whites. Huh? But they are, yes, they are physical stronger than the whites. Hmm? They, they do more work. Your presentation will not give the blacks. If all those things were from Africa, then the blacks were the main driving force in the society. Right? That is what it will help. No, we have to say it. We have to live in just different climates. And it's one man. Body, paper, and everything. We have to go along. Right, we are going to wind up now. It's interesting you're talking about the uh, right.